Hi everyone, this is Solomon Chiriot and we are going to look at uh, uh, unit introduction to structured programming, uh, DIT 1302. Uh, during this particular lesson, we shall get introduced to a few concepts about uh, computer systems and basically uh, programming uh, languages. So we are going to look at uh, computer system, mention a few items or components uh, which relate to computers. We shall look at programming languages, programming fundamentals, and problem solving. Uh, for computer systems, any computer system has three elements or three components. That is uh, the hardware, the physical parts like the keyboard, the processor, the mouse, and so on. We also have uh, the software, which is critical for our unit for this particular class. Uh, the software, which are basically the instructions or computer programs that tell the computer what to do. We also have the important component, which is the liveware, which are the people. Any user or any person who uses a computer or any information produced by the computer. Uh, from your introduction to computer classes, uh, we have dealt with this before, that is uh, the hardware. We have the input units, the mouse for example, we have the CPU which is made up of two main areas, the ALU, arithmetic logic unit for decision making, we have the control unit uh, which makes logical decisions, and we also have the output unit and the storage unit. The ALU does two things, which is important, the computing uh, or uh, calculations, the computations, and we also have the logic part of the CPU. Uh, for software, which as we have said, it is very critical for this particular class, we want to look at how instructions are written so that they can tell the hardware what to perform, or they can basically tell the computer uh, what to uh, what to perform or what to do. We also have, uh, while we look at software, we shall be looking at uh, the instructions and how to write them. As we have mentioned, these particular instructions will tell will tell the computer what to do, and also other programmers on what that particular uh, set of instructions is supposed to uh, do. We also have the liveware which is important, we have mentioned, the users of the computer, any person, you and me, that is. Uh, we have the users of the information. Any information generated by the computer should be used by some people. So those particular people form part of the liveware. So anybody will fall into that particular uh, category. We have the CPU, which is the central processing uh, unit. This is an important area in hardware. Uh, the CPU is basically the part of the computer that makes uh, informed decisions and sometimes we look at it as the brain. Just like a human being, we have the brain which makes, uh, which allows us to make informed decisions. Uh, the CPU will al always uh, retrieve instructions from the memory and of course perform some thing by executing those particular uh, instructions. Now when it comes to uh, computer languages or computer uh, languages, we have this particular formation which is called the computer language or machine language. A computer does not understand human language. So basically we have what we call a computer language which is a set of zeros and ones, or binary uh, digits, binary digits. Sometimes you refer to them as bits. So uh, we have zeros and ones. A collection of zeros and ones uh, are executed within the CPU. The role of the CPU, remember, is to execute commands or instructions. Those particular instructions are in form of uh, zeros and ones. So everything that we uh, deal with, along with the keyboard, the mouse, is usually translated back to computer language, that is uh, zeros and ones. Everything, including the names that you type, your name, uh, your age, everything that we do is usually translated to uh, this critical language, which is uh, made up of zeros and 
ones, a collection of so many of them. Uh, as I have mentioned, uh, we have the binary number system, which is uh, uh, zero, a collection of zeros and ones. That is what the computer understands. Mm -hmm. That is what the computer understands. For human beings, we are used to what we call the decimal number systems, which is zeros and ones. Uh, that is a uh, zero to nine. Zero to nine. For the computer, it is zero, one. For the human beings, or for human beings, we have zero and one. Yes. Uh, we shall not focus on that, as we have done that in introduction to, com uh, introduction to computers. Uh, let's go to or focus on this particular area, which is uh, programming languages. For a programmer, that is somebody who writes instructions, to write the instructions, he or she must be able to either use one of these three uh, languages. Either machine language, which is zeros and ones. We also have another category called assembly language, and we also have high level languages. These are levels which are either low level programming or high level programming. Machine language and assembly language form what we call low level. Low level because they are very closely designed to be executed by the computer without any uh, translation. But for the assembly language, we shall look at that. It requires some bit of uh, translation. We shall talk about translation. Uh, so basically, as we have said, computers do not use uh, human languages like English. Computers don't understand English the way we understand. The computer will understand zeros and ones. And that is why we need some translation somewhere. Because we are going to be writing our programming instructions using this particular uh, high level language. So uh, it is very important for us to understand why we need to talk about machine language, assembly language, and high level language based on their uh, based on the evolution of programming uh, languages. Machine language. We have said machine language is basically a collection of zeros and ones. It is a low level language because the computer directly executes this particular uh, uh, sets of zeros and ones. There is no need of translation when it comes to machine language. So it is actually the natural language of a computer zeros and ones, a collection of so many zeros and ones. So uh, the primitive instructions built into every computer are basically based on this particular uh, low-level language, which is the machine language, or basically the binary language. Uh, any other language will require, of course, the translation, as we have mentioned that. Assembly languages, we have assembly languages because it is difficult to deal with zeros and ones. The reason why we have, we can ask ourselves a question like, uh, why do we have other languages, yet we have a language that the computer understands, that is the machine language. We need this assembly language, we need high level languages, because human beings tend to make a lot of errors, and dealing with a collection of thousands of zeros and ones is not very easy. Finding a mistake, finding an error can be very, very difficult. Assembly languages are actually made up of symbols, symbols or mnemonics, which are abbreviation, abbreviations. Like for example, add. You can say add, add uh, x and, uh, uh, and y, for example. We can say subtract x from y and so on, multiply x, y, multiply x, y, divide, and so on. Lord, this is how the computers will be able to communicate if you are using assembly language. Lord, R1, for example, anything that is in the memory location called R1, you load it to the screen or something like that. So they were developed uh, to make uh, uh, programming easier. As we, I have just mentioned, it is very difficult to deal with machine language which is a collection of zeros and ones. And uh, another thing that is very important for us to note is that 
assembly language code like add, sub, malt, diff, or these particular symbols or mnemonics are very close to English. They are English uh, statements. They are English statements and therefore they need to be converted. They need to be translated into machine code. And we have a translator here, the assembler, we shall talk about it uh, as we proceed. Uh, the assembler does the translation from assembly language to uh, machine language, which the computer can understand. Just the way the, you can talk to somebody uh, who understands uh, French and you understand English, you need somebody in between the two of you so that that person can be able to translate. Uh, we have high level languages. Now this is our focus. High level languages, again, they are made up of English-like and easy to learn uh, statements. They are made up of uh, statements like if, else, uh, while, and so on. Very simple to use for human beings because we understand English. That's the, that's the thing. And we, at the end of the day, we want to make programming easier. Uh, High-level languages were introduced to make, uh, to replace assembly language and machine language, which are low-level in nature, which are low-level in nature. So we have several programming languages which fall under this. We have uh, Java, we have C, C++, Visual Basic. The list is endless. There are very many of them which fall under this particular category. And uh, f even for our class, we shall be using an high-level language to code or to produce uh, statements or instructions that the computer can understand. So take note that we need to be aware, we need to be aware that we have three main levels of uh, languages. We have the machine language, we have the assembly language, and we also have the high level uh, language. Uh, when we talk of uh, programming, when you are writing instructions that the computer will obviously translate, we require that particular code to be translated into machine language. So the process that the, uh, the, uh, the program that you use to write programs will use to translate your language is basically related or based on what is called compiling the source code or compilation of programs. When you are compiling the source code, uh, and source code basically means the code that you write on your computer using a particular specialized application software, when you are writing the source code, you write them in a high level language, if, else, while, and so on. You will require a translator. That one we have mentioned. You require a translator to translate your source code into uh, object uh, code, which you refer to as your object program. Uh, we also have uh, three important things to mention there or to take into consideration within this area. We have the source code we have the translator and we have the object code. Three important elements to note. The source code is the one that you write. You need, uh, the source code is the one that you write using high level language. You need a translator to translate the source code into a format that the computer understand and that is the machine language. That is very critical. Uh, we can see here, we have the source code file, you can save it. We need a translator. A compiler is simply a type of a translator. We have the object file, which is going to be generated by this particular uh, program or special program called the compiler, which is a translator. We also have a linker that is going to link your object code to the particular uh, hardware platform that you are using. And we also have the executable file that can be able to run to perform a particular task. Talking about translators, it's important we take note of this. We have said the translator translates source code to object code that can be easily understood by the computer. And for each of these particular uh, translators, we have a specific 
type of translator. For assembly language, we have a translator called the assembler. For high level languages, we have two types of translators. We have what is called the interpreter, and we also have what is called the compiler. These two, they work for high level languages, or different high level languages, in a different uh, approach. For example, the interpreter will look at each line as you type. The compiler will compile the entire source code once you are finished uh, coding. We can see clearly machine language is missing here. Very simple. Machine language does not require any translation because it is already in a format that the CPU or the processor understands. Now, what are we doing? We are doing uh, an activity. The activity here is programming. And it is an activity, it is an operation that you do. You sit down and uh, do something. So basically programming is the creation of uh, some ordered set of instructions to solve a particular problem using the computer. It is that process that you actually uh, undergo in order to create uh, instructions, uh, test the instructions, and run the program so that it performs uh, something, or so that the computer performs uh, something. Uh, it is also important that it is important for us uh, to note that we need to know how these things, uh, how these things are written. The instructions are written. We don't just write instructions like we are joking. We need to write instructions in a logical order or in a particular order so that the computer can carry out a particular task in uh, using some particular logic or something that makes sense. Uh, before we look at uh, programming elements and so on, we need to understand something in relation to programming. These are important areas that you will take note uh, while you program. While you are programming, you are creating a sequence of instructions, or basically a set of instructions. This set of instructions will perform something. Uh, for your instructions or for your program to do something that makes sense, your instructions should perform what is called decision making and it is based on what is called conditional executions, where we talk of if, for example, if you have a balance, then it means you can be denied access to some facility. For example, you look at your mobile phone. The mobile phone, before you start calling somebody, you can call somebody only if you have some particular credit. So a lot of decisions are made. You want to use the M-Pesa application if and only if you have enough in your account to fulfill what you want to do. Uh, we also have another area which is a repetition, very critical area also, just like decision making, uh, where we do things repeatedly. If you look at uh, a list of counties, a list of a list of students, a list of people. We can generate a list of people using a loop, a list of items using a loop continuously until a particular decision, uh, until a particular condition has been, uh, has been fulfilled or has been met. We also have uh, an important area to take note is that when we are writing these programs, it is important to make your programs smaller in bits so that at the end of the day you can easily manage them, you can easily correct the errors and so on. Uh, we can also uh, use functions which are very important to perform specific uh, tasks. While we program, we have two approaches that uh, you can use. We have procedural approach to programming and we have also, we also have an object oriented approach which is a procedural uh, programming. Uh, procedural programming, we shall be using this for this particular class where we write instructions based on a sequence of instructions. 
So the, the program will perform uh, certain operations, for example, uh, accept inputs, uh, give outputs, and so on. We also have object-oriented programming. You'll be doing uh, that in your uh, next semesters. Uh, problem solving, which is, I can say, stroke programming. When you are doing programming, you are actually solving a particular uh, problem. You are trying to solve a particular program, a problem that the society is facing, that you are facing, that your organization is facing, your friend is facing, uh, and so on. So basically, we write instructions so that we can be able to solve uh, problems that are within a particular environment. So when you are solving these particular uh, problems, you need to actually ask yourselves uh, several things before you start working on any uh, set. For example, you need to ask yourself, I want to find an answer to a question. You need to figure out how to perform a task. And you also need to figure out how to make uh, things work or how to make uh, the program uh, work and, of course, achieve the objective. So uh, we shall look at four steps uh, that are very critical according to Polyas uh, problem solving uh, steps. We have these important elements. We need to understand the problem that we are solving. We solve problems every day. When you wake up, you think of something, it means you want to solve a particular uh, task. In the kitchen, you, want, you need to understand what you want to do. You want to prepare uh, some meal, you need to understand what you want to deal with, and so on. Uh, you need to understand the problem very clearly. You also need to devise a good plan to come up with a solution. You also need to implement the plan. In our case, we write the programs and we need to evaluate the solution. So uh, just briefly, uh, when we are trying to understand the problem, basically we want to look at uh, what are the inputs for a particular uh, outputs. We expect some output to come from the system and therefore we need to understand the inputs. So basically it is based on and identifying the nouns and the unknowns. We need to understand the description or you describe the problem fully so that you can be able to uh, solve and achieve your act activity. Uh, we also have this which is very important. You need to decide how to go about the uh, problem solving and determine what steps that you will require. But most importantly, when you are understanding the problem, think of the outputs. That is, of course, what you expect. If you are preparing tea, you know the, the output is tea. And therefore, you need to know the inputs that you will require. Uh, I have mentioned that. This is very important. We need the, to understand the inputs, and we also need to understand the outputs. How you are going to do it is also uh, very critical because we need to transform the inputs so that we can get the outputs. Very important. And when we get the output, of course, we are solving, uh, uh, the, we are getting the solution of that particular uh, problem. So it is very important to take note of these particular uh, steps, U, D, I, E. Uh, the next item is you devise a plan. Uh, you devise a plan for that particular uh, problem. Now that you understand the problem, you need to devise a plan. Come up with uh, an algorithm. Come up with a pseudocode. Come up, uh, come up with a flowchart so that these particular algorithms will give you the steps, the very clear steps and logical steps that you need to execute uh, or to find the solution or execute the program. Very, very important. Uh, just to mention, when you talk of an algorithm, basically I have mentioned that uh, we look at the steps which make sense, which are logical, or which make logic, and so on. And when we approach these algorithms, we can either use uh, pseudocodes or uh, flowcharts. A pseudocode is simple, just steps in English format, English like statements. 
that tell you, you begin from here, you do this, you do this, you do this, and you stop here. Just using logic that makes sense. We also have flowcharts, which is a diagram that uh, I'll give you an example for that. Uh, the flowchart is a diagram. It Graphically, it gives you uh, the steps, unlike the statements in a pseudocode. This one gives you a graphical representation of the steps that you need to perform or that are needed in order to arrive to a particular, uh, a particular uh, solution. These are flowchart example. These symbols are specific. We shall be looking at that. The symbols are very specific. We start somewhere, we stop somewhere. This is just a, a basic example of a problem that you can face in your room, at home, or anywhere. If you lost an item, you can start somewhere. You start by uh, let the, the process. You start the look process. For example, look for the lost item. This is a process. Make a decision. Have I found, have I found the item? No. There are two outcomes here. This is a decision. If yes, we can stop looking. If no, we go back and continue with the process. And again, you can ask yourself, do I need this thing? If you don't need it, then you can stop looking for it. If you need it, it's very important, then you continue with the look uh, for process. Another example is a programming example here. If you want to find the sum of two numbers, we start somewhere, we end somewhere. So we can start, then we key in the two numbers. If there are three, you can add number three. Then this is a process. A rectangle gives you a process. Uh, this uh, gives you input or output. This, uh, this particular symbol is used for input or output. So the rectangle here will give you the process, the start, an oval will give you a start and end. So uh, you can start somewhere, you key in the numbers, you give a formula, how to find the sum, then you print out the sum, and there's nothing else, you stop. A pseudocode, we have said, is based on English. Words. You can begin somewhere and end somewhere. And this must appear somewhere. Begin, you start somewhere and stop somewhere. So we have number one, number two, and number three. You can declare these items. Uh, sum is a number. S1 can represent number one. S2 can represent number two, no problem. Then uh, you can tell the user, enter. So on the screen, this is output. On the screen, somebody will see input a number, then input. You also see on the screen, output a number. Output, uh, that is input number two. Then you are given a chance to key in. You process, then give the output. Then you stop. Very easy. Uh, implementation comes in when you are programming. This is our step three. First of all, we understand, then devise a plan, then we are in implementation part. Now you use a programming language to code. You use a programming language to produce, uh, to write the instructions. You code in order to come up with a program. So basically, during this particular uh, time, you'll be able to do some, uh, to code and test. Code and test. If I key in one, if I key in three, is it giving me four for the sum of one and three? So you need to test and test and test. Very important. Evaluate the solution. Run the code. Check if the results are correct. Because sometimes you key in numbers, one and two, for example, but you don't get the desired results. If I key in four and key, uh, and key in five and I get negative one, it means there is a problem somewhere. If I was finding the sum, instead of nine, I'm getting negative one. So it means there is a problem somewhere. So make sure you test. Don't just sit and say uh, there is there's an output or there is some output on the screen. So look at your code, evaluate the solution, make sure you are getting you get you are getting the expected results. You compare. 
Uh, in summary, when we are dealing with uh, problem solving, we need to always understand the problem. Identify these inputs, identify the processes, identify how these processes are going to generate the outputs. Three areas when you are understanding. Make sure you understand the inputs or get all the inputs so that you can be able to generate some output using a given formula, which is a process. Then you uh, devise a plan. Devise a plan. How am I going to, to, uh, to solve this particular? What are the steps that are needed to get to the solution? So uh, this is also very important. Uh, we also look at implementation. That is where you code using a programming language, maybe Java, maybe C, C++, Python, and so on. Then always make sure you test your solution and ensure that the solution is actually what you wanted. As we have said, sometimes programs gives you, uh, they can give you wrong, uh, wrong uh, outputs, even if they produce the outputs. Uh, now I have something to leave you, yeah? Especially for the algorithms. This is an homework for you to look at carefully. A very simple algorithm. You write an algorithm to serve as how to instructions for some relatively simple task or activity. Any activity of your own choice or of your own uh, choosing. You choose the task. It should be 10 to 20 uh, steps in length or lines. Assume you are writing instructions for somebody who has never performed a task. What we are saying here is that no assumptions. Never assume or never, uh, never skip a particular step. For example, in our, in our pseudocode, we said output sum. If we do not say that, then basically somebody who is going to write the program will not be able to write the code uh, for that particular area. So make sure you do this. Basically, when you are writing an algorithm, it's just a recipe of how you are going to perform tasks. So make sure you do that. Any activity, any activity of your own choosing, you do that. Uh, we shall be looking at, uh, or we shall be discussing some of these things in our e-learning platform so that in case you have any challenge, again, before we meet in our next class, we make sure you have, uh, we have, we are in the same page. So that in case you have any challenge, you mention, we solve it, or we advise one another, and so on. So let's do this before our next class, and that is it for today's class. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.